Hi, everyone. Carmine Dodisco here with the Launch Network. Awesome show coming up. Finally, we got a great show here, the UIA Workshop Series Season 2. We've been doing an awesome shows here. Hey, Warren, let's bring them on. What's going on, man? We got some great, great things happening. This is our, this is season two, episode nine. This is our 19th, Carmen, it's amazing. It's our 19th uh, educational program for the UIA over the, over the spring and the fall. It's awesome. It's been absolutely awesome. Yeah. We've got some awesome guests. You will get a lot of feedback too. Yeah. The numbers are growing every week and uh, the content's terrific. And uh, yeah, we're working on a lot of good things. So even though, you know, it's funny this year, even though the world kind of shut down, thank goodness for, for Zoom and, and our reach out and our following and all, and it uh, feels like, you know, business as usual. So, yeah, no doubt. I've been watching on social media. It seems like uh, when you share something, you know, you got a lot of people, they're just sharing it out. I mean, I, I got this, I got information on this show, this particular workshop, like five or six times on my feed. <laughs> uh, we got, we, our guests have been awesome. The pitch panels have been terrific. And our show today is going to be awesome. I can't wait to get to our guests, but I, it's just, it's just really great content and they're really in depth too, you know, and I know you can sometimes do these things for, you know, five, 10 minute videos and you get a little bit of fluff out there, but we really get into depth. I mean, if people hang in there and by the way, if you have to go, we understand, just come back to the UIA website, uiausa.org. All of the, all of them are in our, our library and our files there. You can watch any of the old shows and then Carmine, you and I have done a lot of shows together before that. So we've got another couple dozen of um, educational shows. And please go back and check out the content. And we really get into depth on a lot of stuff. Yeah. And these are from people that are top in the industry. This isn't just, you know, we're grabbing somebody to talk about it. You know, some of our guests are really the guys in the industry. Yeah, we don't hang with, with uh, people. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a privilege to come on. So and yeah. I'm already getting, hey, Carmen, I'm already getting people – who want to be on the show in the spring or, you know, after the first of the year too. That's so great. That's, that's awesome. Cool. I, I'm actually just completing a, an unbelievable licensing deal with lifetime. And the, the engineer is an optical engineer uh, involved in eye things and has uh, teams all around the world. And uh, he wants to come on and people are watching the show, you know, and, and they want to come on. And, that's and, awesome. You know, got Marcy, right. She wants to come on. So anyway, it's going to be fun. We're going to keep this going. Cool. Well, so. All right. Cool. But let, yeah, but let's get to today's show. So, Carmine, I'm, we're going to turn you around today, and you're going to be uh, one of the guests. But before we uh, reintroduce you, because everybody knows you already. I'm so nervous. I'm nervous. <laughs> we're talking about manufacturing. But it's my pleasure today to introduce to the UIA community, Chris Guerrera. And uh, Chris is a really good friend uh, based down in Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, first, Chris, hi, how you doing? I'm doing great, Warren and Carmine. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. And I'm really excited to, you know, I know you well and I know your background. I'm particularly excited to introduce you to, to folks that maybe you don't know yet. And once they hear about your background, they're really going to fall in love with what you do and what you bring to the table. But before we get there, you're in South Carolina. And what the heck? You got a giant Saquon Barkley jersey right behind you. Yeah, I, I, full disclosure, I mean, let's talk about the, the Carter jersey first, okay? Oh, yeah, I'm a Vikings fan first. Okay. Right. My heart does bleed with the Yankees, but I'm, you know, and because of my family, I'm a Giant fan second, but let's not confuse the Vikings first. All right. 50 years of pure pain, just so you know. <laughs> I see a lot of sports memorabilia, baseball bats, and so on. Anyway, well, we appreciate all your sports interests, but I want to introduce Chris as, as uh, this show today is Made in America, but Chris really uh, is a renaissance guy in our industry and, and does a number of different things. But today, we're really going to tap in, and we're going to have him back on other subjects in the future. But today, what we really want to tap into, Chris, is, is, is his background in manufacturing. And what a lot of people don't realize, and when I met for Chris first, you know, I didn't even I, – I met him a couple times before I realized he has an unbelievable background in serious, big-time manufacturing in America in plants – car plants, auto plants, the car I drive, he <laughs> probably was oversaw its production. And uh, I really want to get him to talk about that a little bit. So maybe we'll start there. We're going to get into Made in America. We're going to get into why manufacturing in America is great. We're going to get into the grassroots details of what's going on now. But, but Chris, I'd love you just to introduce yourself a quick bit about your background and then just tell people about your, your background in the automotive fields and other, other manufacturing plants. You've been yeah, seeing. sure, Warren. I, I'm happy to do that. So I, I'm a I'm an engineer. I spent quite a bit of time in the design engineering field early on in my career, then, then got into tooling and 
really went into operations. And I think it, from a, from a standpoint of when I, I say my, my career catapulted and changed, I was working for Ford Motor, a division of Ford, and we did a lot of fuel system and suspension components, which I had four plants at the time that, that reported into me. I spent quite a bit of time doing a one-eighth turn gas cap that I'm on that patent as a chief design engineer, which ended up in the lobby of Ford Motor Company. That wow. was pretty, pr pretty intense. And from there, I went to BMW and, and truly uh, became the, the Lean Six Sigma guy that I am. I was trained all over the world. I spent time in, uh, in France and in Germany and China, Japan, Brazil, Spain, but really, really engulfed in learning Six Sigma and then bringing it back to the manufacturing plant because what BMW typically does is, is compare all their plants as one unit and they compare them against each other. So I'm, I'm up against people in Mexico for the best plant in the world where, you know, your labor cost is a lot lower than your cost would be in the U.S. So we had to find ways to really improve the process and, and eliminate cost to maintain that competitive edge. So if I was a little bit higher in labor, I made sure my purchasing costs were better or my operational costs were better. And at some point over a three-year period, we went from a ranking of like 34 out of 36 plants to number three, and then eventually became the number one plant. So you can only imagine what that's like sitting in a corporate meeting with 500 executives and I'm the number one plant. Wow. Cool. Now let me, let me back you up because I want to hear more about that. But what, what, when you started at Ford, like what did you start a training program? I mean, how did you get involved in, with? No, with I, 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 was, I started as a design engineer. So I, I was doing a lot of, a lot of design, CAD work, uh, really uh, involved in finite element analysis, which I, I really love. You know, back in the day, you know, I don't want to date myself. Back in the day, the big camera systems had the big screens and the tablets. And, you know, you're typing with your left hand, hitting the tablet with your right hand and drawing up on a screen. You know, to some point where it became laptop size. So it, it went from that paradigm to really designing on a, on a computer. And, and uh, I spent quite a bit of time doing different types of product designs for uh, suppliers of Ford and of Ford. And then, uh, you know, my name got out there pretty well. And I started getting a lot of different offers with different companies. And something about the BMW one struck me. You know, I, I took a trip down and saw the plant. It was unbelievable, and it's ironic at the time. Carolina, right? Oh yeah, in Greenville, the plant is. Um, you know, at the time, it was 50 cars a day, and you know, 200 people. The interior group that delivered to the to the assembly plant. Today, it's where I'm back now in Greenville is over 12,000 people, and if you drive down 85, yeah. you know, they've added on. I think they they do all of the X's now. They've added on to the plant. It's like over two million square feet. The entire highway 85 is, is, I and the Greenville area is absolutely, it was blowing up in the 90s. Today, it's, I, I just can't tell you how, how incredibly nice. What it do is. they make there? What do they, I know they make the X, X5s, X3s, X2, X2, they make all the X's, X2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and now the 7. Which is the SUVs for people who aren't, don't know the model. Yeah, it's and, all, and, it, and when, the when I ran it, what's that? The X Men, too. Yeah, no kidding. When I was there, that we were doing the Z3 that converted to the Z4 and the, the new X5. And that's when, it's a funny story because that's back in the day, the X5 was late to the market, right? Everybody said, ah, oh, it's never going to sell. Everyone's got an SUV. You're too late in the market. It's, you know, it's an executive vehicle. It's tie end. It's going to cost too much. And so BMW called it an SAV, activity vehicle. So you can also drive it off road 60, 70 miles an hour. But okay, the moral of the story is <laughs> look how many X's there are now, right? It's 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 blown up. So that whoever said that they were too late to the market obviously didn't have a clue. Hey, now, today, now, yeah, but but, but the yeah. largest exporter in the world out of Carolina right now. Wow. So all those X models are shipped around the world. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, oh yeah, there's right hand drive, left hand drive, it's, there's um, all these different options. Different lines, you know, there's an X2 line, X3 line. They have a plant that they build just for the, the X3 and X4. So it, it's, it's big, but you know, like any other plant, they still have the same problems from 20 years ago. <laughs> now, 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 listen, you know how, you know, they had that program, you can go to Germany, you know, mm -hmm. 
drive the car around Europe and then ship it home. Now, <laughs> can, I, can I go down to South Carolina and pick up my next X5, maybe save five grand or something? I'm sure I could hook you up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then drive. I mean, you know, you know, being friends with the president, I'm not like, throwing any names out here. Canoe Floor, if he's watching, hey, Canoe. The president of BMW, I'm sure I can, I can pull something for you. All right. Well, I, I, I've had uh, four X5, so I'm, I'm, uh, we'll be uh, on the phone later, bro. Anyway, uh, so listen, let's uh, we're, uh, stop right there for a second because that's great background. Carmine, we're going to get you in on this conversation a little bit too. Tell us a little bit about your, your manufacturing background, then we'll start to get into some, some, some real lessons for you. Oh, awesome. Yeah, no problem. I, I, um, I'm kind of scared at following uh, Chris there because he's got a, a lot more experience in the real deal manufacturing than I do, but I've always been uh, a product guy. Uh, started in the early 2000s uh, with products of my own, with inventions and items and made a lot of mistakes, which is good. I made them on my own stuff, just like all of us inventors. Learned from my mistakes, um, worked with manufacturers around the world. Uh, everybody thinks about just China, but there's manufacturing all over the world in Asia, you know, Canada, Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, you know, there's so many different places to make products. And I really started to explore those different um, places and uh, different technologies and knowledge. Each, each country has uh, knowledge on different types of products. And I just learned from there. I love making products. I love solving problems. And, uh, you know, I am same thing learning from Chris that there's so much better ways in which to do things that you can constantly learn from your mistakes and make things better. Absolutely. And do you, now I know you, you, uh, so sometimes you work with inventors and you, you have the products made here in America or you decide together where you're going to have a manufacturer. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we always look at the product, we diagnose it, see where the best place to make that product will be. Like if it's a big, heavy product, we'll look to either U S makes manufacturer or maybe Mexico or Canada in some cases, because obviously it's real heavy. It's got to come across the board. We always look at tariffs and taxes and, and shipping costs. So really looking at the, looking at the product, diagnosing it, seeing what technologies have to be implemented and then going out to those different countries or different factories and being able to um, really cherry pick the best of both worlds uh, helps me in my manufacturing practice. Absolutely. So Chris, so getting back to you, before we, we start to jump into specific examples, uh, Chris, listen, a lot of times I'll see your name and then after your name are all these letters. And they, and they look like some Roman letters, you know, they start with L and then they- It's like the Super Bowl. Yeah. And so tell us about those letters and what you did to earn, earn those degrees. Yeah, those are some painful letters because it's, um, you know, it's a whole lean process. You start with a yellow and you work your way all up to a master black belt. So in, in the BMW world and, and, um, and truly becoming a master, you had to, had to implement and facilitate in six different countries. I've spent um, hours and days and years of learning how to truly do Lean Six Sigma at the highest levels in different countries. And then with that training, I had to bring it back to the plant and, and implement it. So then you have to go back and teach, you know, 800 people at the time in that facility in the interior group, how to do a single minute exchange die. So how to change tools quickly. We can talk more in detail about that, but, you know, two and a half hour tool change, capital equipment, sitting idle, you got to build inventory banks. Well, now if you can do it in 10 minutes, you can build to order, right? It, and, it, and it's how you organize it. Right? So there's, there's value streams and how you look at cost on the line and how you, how you associate labor when you assemble products. So a lot goes into it. There was a lot of time for me to, uh, to ring those check marks. And, and I'll tell you, when I first started to do it, I, I, I question like what more could I possibly learn? I'm already doing, I'm running the plant. It's, you know, it was a time of a $60 million plant and eventually became a $180 million plant. But there was so much going on in a growing environment, new products, you know, new, new designs coming in, change over model years. And now I have to add another, but another thing to my list. But I, you know, I look back now and well, I, am, I am so grateful that I did get that opportunity to learn it because everything I do now, I, I use Six Sigma. I use the lean, five S, eight weights. I use it all. You, you have such a serious background. And so one thing that I'm always, you know, uh, chuckle about, you know, is in our industry, you know, people sort of come in, you're not sure where they came from and next thing they're experts. 
you come with a, this ridiculous amount of it. This is not like sourcing a product or putting together a deal with China or something. This is about you actually being in the plant on the line and doing it. And so maybe, maybe I, I know one of your experiences that you put to work in a very practical sense that maybe people can relate to because cars are big, you know, is you went up to the Oneida plant in, in, in New York and, and that, that's obviously consumer goods and you turn that whole assembly around and all. Talk a little bit about that and lessons that an inventor may pick up on what they should look for on the line there. Yeah, you know, I, I, as I was telling Carmine earlier today when we talked, I, I use, I try to break the initial, the initial dive into lean, very simple, five S's, eight waste. You know, what are they? I, I, you go to a plant, and, I, and I've been doing this a long time, you go to a plant, and, and people want to do the right thing. But when you watch people walking around the plant, I mean, in some cases, like Oneida had too much inventory. They had 55,000 square feet of floor space for manufacturing. You know, it's it, three different floors. So you, you can only imagine when you look at value, when you do a value stream, there's there's so much waste in that process. And then you quote a 12 to 16 week lead time. I look back and I go, okay, who's buying and waiting 12 to 16 weeks? And over a, a, a three year period, we got this down to- Flatware, it's flatware, right? Flatware and- uh, It was uh, air systems, air system control from okay. really small, simple items that you can use you know, as a, like a shop vac right up through Big, big companies like Ford and, and BMW and GM use them off the back of their plants to administer the, the filtration of air. And, and you try to break it down as simple as possible. You look at 5S, right? You first, you got to sort what you need in the cell, the work cell, and what you don't need. Then you got to set it. You set everything in order, right? So you, and then you really got to make sure it's organized. And, and, and it starts with the people. It starts with training everybody because you go too deep into Six Sigma, you go into too deep in, in some of these videos and these, these spaghetti charts and value streams, you start losing people. And if you lose them, you'll never get them back. So you got to start really simple. You, you, everybody wants to do a good job. I build, I start with building relationships, understanding what people who, who work in the, in the environment un, understand now what they need, and then start putting in systems and train them in the system. And what you find is they want to do, everybody wants to do the right thing. They start really abiding to it and it becomes a little bit of a contest. You have contests between shifts, between departments. You actually have five S scores. In this case, so just for you golf guys, in this case, the higher score is not good. That means you have more more points against you. You want, you know, world class starts going in at 40 out of 100. You know, you start getting to 20, you are doing things amazing. Like when you walk into a plant, you know, that's another thing me and Carmen discussed today. You walk into a plant, the first impression you get right is, is everlasting it's hard to change i always say if you're, if you're if you're a good kid and you do people forgive you if you're a bad kid and you finally do something right nobody cares right so it's the same thing with your first impression you want to be sure that that what they see is what they get right so so we, we we look at that and we do data so you have before state after state you have data before data after photos before Photos after, then you start assigning leaders in the plant. And it's amazing when you get a group of people doing the right thing the right way, how fast things move. Sales go up, bottom line improves, and everybody's happy. That's, that's awesome. So, all right, well, hold that, that thought right there. Carmine, let's switch over to you for a second. Tell us a little bit about the experience, because we're going to come back and, and fold this into what Chris's background is. Here, here with the inventors in America and who are watching the show today, do, do a lot of them come to you and say, hey, I want to have my products made in America? Um, or, or do you work with them and determine, a, 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 you know, where you want to go and so forth? Tell us a little bit about the inventor experience. So, yeah, one of the greatest experiences that I have, and that's what's so great about having not only the UIA uh, behind us, but Chris and being able to reach out to people. I'd say 80 to 90% of the clients or people that reach out to me, not only just for questions or just need my help, would like to have their product made in the United States or the USA. It's very important to them. It's a sense of pride, as Chris and you have talked about in many places. And uh, a lot of times it can be made here. Um, they just have to have the right product, the right information. They have to know 
that there are going to be certain parameters that they have to hit to make that product here. And that's, again, um, one of those things that I work with those clients about. Some products just aren't good fit for the U.S. Uh, you know, it, it just, it's just how it goes. There are better countries that can make some products, but the majority of them can be made in the U.S. And that's why it is so great to be having somebody like Chris to be able to reach out to. So, so Chris, let's, let's throw it right back to you. The, the, uh, so listen, you, you have your own products that you, you, you've brought to market and then you help other inventors. So tell us a little bit about that experience and do, do most of those products, are you making them here in the U S or what's, what's the process? That I make, I make everything in the U S I mean, literally everything, including the resin that the injection mold sees, you know, to me, can't be part in, part, you know, part out. You have to be all in and we're all in. But, you know, before we get to, let me tell you a little bit about, about the sophistication of, of when you do something in the U.S. It, 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 that whole misconception of, of it's more expensive, it, that is absolute not true. And I prove that in and out with my models. When I look at BMW, right, talking about live broadcast, they make sure all their suppliers are 30 miles around them. You get a car that falls off a stacker that you have a, a, a live broadcast notice that hits the assembly plant. So if it's a door panel or, or a instrument panel or a glove box, you literally have to pull the, the, they usually send about 20 to 28 vehicles at a time. You have to pull what's needed. So you have to pull from the warehouse, what's needed for material to the assembly line, build it, put it into an assembly rack, put it on a truck, deliver it to the plant in less than an hour and a half. By the second hour, it's on the vehicle. So if you can just picture that for a second, the intensity of having the right inventory, not having too much inventory, having good process controls, having the quality standards met through process, not inspected in, but they're met through process, and then delivered to a plant. And, and when, when that operator pulls the door panel, it's there. They put it on the car. If not, the line shuts down and the business side of the plant gets charged $1,100 a minute. Wow. wow. You can imagine the stress level when that happens. Wow. So I take that level of detail and I bring it to what I'm doing now. Nothing by, the way, by the way, do, do, do we do a better, you said you were a number one plant. Do we do, a, are we good at that? I mean, in America, are our standards as high as anywhere in the world? It's, yeah, I mean, it's based on, it's, it's, it's based on inventory management. It's based on uh, quality. And it's, it's based on purchase goods. So those three have a direct effect to how you deliver and the cost you deliver it to. So it, it's not like it's uh, these are made up numbers. These are the same numbers that you have to achieve. Like with, in quality, it's PPM, parts per million. It, it, you can't cheat that number. It's what you're shipping against what your defect rate is. Right. Okay, so it's, it's a standard across the world. And so when I take that to the US, yep. I take it the same way. I've got suppliers that are local to me, we're, especially in the injection molding facility. We're injection molding in the plant. We're, we're typically molding to order, so I, you're not building inventory, because I always get, I, I'm not an inventory guy. You know, if you, if you bought it over, uh, over yonder and you, you wait 90 days to get it, and now you have a quality issue, two things have to happen. You have to rework it, which is cost, or you have to scrap it and start over, which is a whole other element. So typically build to order. Uh, we have suppliers local. So in cases where the demand is fast and we have to deliver quickly, if we have to have somebody drive a truck to the plant, they do. It's not shipping it from California. It's driving it 30 minutes. So another important element. And then we look at all of the process controls so that we can eliminate any type of waste. So on labor, and this is where we get competitive on labor, we're able to mold when we're molding, the, the labor that's already applied to that cost for molding, now we're using it to do value add on the outside. So if there's stickers or labels or pads or boxing, anything that has to happen on the outside of the machine while it's molding, there is technically no cost. I call it free labor because you've already assigned that labor to the part as it's molding. And it goes into a box, onto a pallet, and out the door. While I'm looking at the quality is being checked every piece that's coming off. If it's a destructive component where we gotta break something, we send it off and a quality individual comes and checks it every 10 pieces, every 100 pieces. But we know that what we're shipping is always right. It's not coming back. And I can tell you, of all the products that I've shipped, 
I have probably the, I, I haven't seen anything come back from retail on the quality stuff that we've just recently shipped. Wow. It's the, the lowest possible return rate you can have. But how do you, you know it's critical? How do you do that now? Are, do you do you spend time on site? Are you uh, do you, you you have obviously people that you trust that you work with? I mean, uh, yeah, any new product that I launch, I'm on site, so I'm helping set up that whole lean process. Really? Yeah, people on site that I work with that are trained in lean and understand lean, and they know what my expectations are. So you know, it's like anything else. When you, I told you this to Carmen earlier, the best sign of a good plant manager is one that can leave the plant. And it will run as good as when he's in the plant, right? You don't have to be there because systems are what, what control the quality. You're actually building quality into the product through your process and you're not inspecting it in after. That, so, that's a big deal. So do you have relationships with a number of factories or do you go out by need and find them and put them through their paces? How, how do you go through that process? Yeah, it all depends on what the product is, but typically I partnered up with a facility that I use primarily in New Hampshire, my hometown. And I have several other in New York and, and even in Carolina that I, that I use. It, you know, it, there's, there's, a, there's a size and tonnage requirement based on the size of the part. Some plants have that capability and some don't. So the ones that I feel most comfortable with that have those capabilities, always get the first crack because they truly do understand the process that's required to deliver a part at low cost, high quality, and the fastest speed to the market. Cool. Well, now, I'm going to take a break there, go to Carmen. I want to come back and talk about some of the specifics like Tidy Hook and some of the things you're working on. But um, Carmen, so tell us a little bit more about your background, how you got into that through your connections with Home Shopping Network and uh, how you eventually, you know, sort of started off on the product and then started into manufacturing? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So um, back in the early 2000s, uh, I ran into him one day, uh, Mr. Bob Sarcosta. If uh, any of you know who that is or that name, he was one of the main people that started up HSN. He has actually sold the first can opener on the radio. And if you didn't know that HSN actually started on the radio, right here in Clearwater, Florida. I was on a radio and he ended up selling a few can openers and sold out of can openers. And him and um, his partner said, man, we might have something here. Uh, so I ran into Bob and uh, you know, worked with Bob for a number of years. And after a while, I realized that there were so many good products that just weren't a good fit for HSN. And, and the people were devastated because they would send them away saying, hey, we you know, need, but those products could go and be sold to retail or on Amazon or different places, they weren't good, good for it for HSN, which is a very specific type product. And a lot of them weren't ready. A lot of them had the idea they had a prototype or they just had one version or it wasn't ready for be manufactured. And that was really what I wanted to do was I always like making things, always like fixing problems and, and manufacturing and doing prototypes, even with my own products. So I started taking on some of those clients and working through and that's kind of how it was born. I just, uh, I really love making products, manufacturing, and uh, cut my teeth, uh, like I said, uh, making mistakes, finding the right ways to do this. As, uh, as Chris had mentioned, finding the best way to do something, not only at uh, a good cost, but to be able to make that best product possible is so important. Now, how did they find you? How do your clients find you? Or how did they, in the beginning, how did you, you know, was it all through Bob? I mean, obviously he has a big, you know, following and so forth. But as you went on your own, do, do just people search around and eventually they come to meet someone like yourself? Yeah, you know, it's one of those things that uh, whoever has the loudest voice, I think people will follow in some, some ways. And I've always been able to have the loudest voice. <laughs> uh, when I, I'm kind of like you, uh, Warren and, and, and Chris, uh, we're passionate about certain things and we really talk wholeheartedly about it. And I really saw that inventors were not only being led in the wrong direction, with certain books and certain types of things, but um, you know, they just didn't have all the information. So they would go in that direction and I just, it would just drove me so crazy. So I really started having a loud voice. I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted people to get their products made in the right way so that we're able to sell to retail and HSN, QVC, uh, home shopping or Amazon, just in the right place. So, so I think that's one of the biggest things that drove me is that I saw inventors um, just getting the wrong information and uh, I love supplying them with the correct information that I thought would be beneficial for them. Well, good, good for you. So, Chris, let's turn back. So, let's, let's go through this quintessential American experience. Let's, <laughs> let's use the tidy hook, okay? 
Yeah. And and so so tell us a little bit about how you came up with the with the concept. Uh, I presume you maybe you patented. Uh, I'm not sure entirely, but how you, how you started to develop it, and then and then how you've gotten it to market. I, I know you've te tested in a number of places. I know you're selling. I think at Walmart now. Yeah. Tell us yeah. just about that whole American supply chain from your brain to shelf. Love this product. Love it. So I'll start with showing you the tiny hook fits on the side of the seat around the headrest. So it's the only one that fits only type of uh, compartment or storage bag in the vehicle that fits on the side of the seat. That's, that's number one. So a lot goes into that, right? Design wise, Vernon spent a lot of time, Vernon's my partner on this, spent a lot of time developing it, designing it with different colleges. When we finally, I finally just decided that um, if, if he went to China and on this one, it just would have been, he would have lost for so many reasons. From, from an inventory standpoint, from a time to market, um, and we had problems with the material, that would have just completely killed this product. So when you look at this product, right, a lot of work went into this living hinge. This thing will mold and fit around any vehicle under wow. cold temperature and extreme hot temperature. So when we first started out on this, the, the big part of it is this clip, right? It's got to snap around the headrest and it has to fit various sizes. So the first material we used, which was a, pretty much a straight polypropylene, which at low temps was cracking. So here's to my point. This was made abroad, and you spent $100,000 sending over inventory. There's a good chance that this would have failed in the field. And this is not repairable. This is your out of business failure, right? So we were able to go in the plant. We made some changes on ring gates so we can get this to flow a little bit better. We changed the material so that no matter what temperature, we got this down to minus 150. So if you're at a minus 150 in your car, you're dead, right? And the tidy hook will still perform, okay? <laughs> Always good to know. Yeah. On the high end, 250, this will continue to snap, no cracks. We did finite element analysis on it. We did material evaluation in the plant on site. We had probably seven different variations that we were testing from colors to different ethylene blends, there's a whole mix to a point where this thing is now as robust as it gets. When I was on the phone on, uh, on a Zoom a buyer meeting with Walmart, I told them all the testing I did, and the, the last thing that had to be done in Walmart's eyes after we went through and did all of our packaging, you know, it's all five feet, it's all ready to go, five seconds, we got PDQs. I said, we, we, we can't break this. It's, it's indestructible, and you know what that sets up, right? Well, we're going to let you know if it's indestructible. We're going to do our own testing. I said, well, you do it and let me know how you make out. <laughs> well, I'm onboarding it now for Walmart. <laughs> ah, well, that's pretty cool. So, so now Walmart in particular, Chris, right, they, they look for products made in America, right? Yeah, they have a whole section now. That's what they want. This last group was their initiative. It's all made in the USA. And I presented quite a bit, and I've got uh, quite a bit of, of interest in it, and uh, they, they love it. I, I thought these, 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 these Zoom meetings were really, really good in that, you know, I, I was there in Bentville in February live, and, and it's easier to show these things, you know, show packaging and how it works live, but I had to put together this nice presentation, videos, able to show the product, and it, it, the message was clear. Cost is, you know, you know, in Walmart, cost is competitive, right? This part has to be made cost competitive or you can't, you won't sell it, right? That, that's part of the competition. So I go back to low cost, high quality and speed to market. And we meet that in every criteria. Now we're doing injection molding, right? With value add, do some assembly. You got to really look at the assembly, make sure that it's truly leveled and it's balanced so that as the machine's running, you still have some labor to, to put into the assembly and you can meet the demand. There's always, that consideration when you look at broad versus here. But we, we've been competitive and we've been delivering and the quality on these things, you know, they come with, with some high level bags. You know, you, you've probably seen the tidy hook bags. These are all like heavy, heavy duty. They're, 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 the the mill rates are not in the market, six gallon for the, uh, for the auto and, and a 10 gallon for the home, which is another different version on the home. Again, lots of work went into these things. It's clips, right? Heavy duty, you can't break them. They'll fit over anything. They snap in. So lots of design work went into it. You'll hear the click. And lots of, uh, lots of material considerations. I love that you created your own bag for this thing. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a separate market. So we sell bags as well. 
you can use your typical grocery bag, but like Warren, if you're driving around an X5, I'm not sure you want to spill any soda <laughs> on the carpet, because those bags will break. These won't. You know, we have a black one, we have a white one, they will not break. Hey, Chris, I Warren's got a my box. Reusable. Mike, Warren's got a my box. Don't let him mess you. <laughs> You need a place to you need to put need a place to hide your weed though. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and the beauty of these, you can like take them for your kids. Uh, you can put drinks in one side. It, it, I made this thing again, symmetrical. It fits on either side of the seat, right? You can use them in the back bucket seats, front bucket seats. Um, it, it's easy for the for the driver as he's driving to reach. Kids in the back gives it a new compartment. This the the spacing in the back. You can sit in the back seat, and this will sit. As I showed you, on the side of the seat, so you, you don't have you haven't lost any space. Now the bags the space that wasn't being used. The bags, Chris, they come from a different plant, or, or yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah, we, but they're made in the U.S. They're actually made in Carolina, ironically yeah. enough. So you in Greenville, them. South Carolina. But now you source them, and then where, where where do you pack them in? Up at the up at the main plant. Yeah, everything shipped to um, to um, uh, Amherst, New Hampshire. The bags were tricky because a lot of people say they're made in the USA. You really got to do your due diligence on that and check it. A lot of them are brought in from overseas and assembled or done. And some things are, are changed and added to in the U.S. This bag is literally made. Everything is made in the U.S. Packaging, the resin, the, the assembly, and the, the bags. All of it is a made in USA product, 100%. That's awesome. So, so Carmen, I want to hold on one more second because I want to come back to you with HSM. But, Chris, the, you know, one of the things I always think about is, is when you go to China, it seems like you have to up your quantities, especially in the beginning, to, to pack containers and to make it, you know, efficient, you know, shipping-wise. That's something that you can avoid here in the U.S., right? I mean, you can do yeah, something. We, Carmen and I spent a lot of time on that. That's a big deal. Again, going back to building, if I had, if we had built these out of the original material, let's say, in China, and you spent $100,000, they came in, and these clips were breaking, it's over. You're not, you're not getting a second chance. You can't, you can't fix that. So we're able to build to order in this case. You know, we, we have, we have a, a two-cavity mold, and we can duplicate that as we need it. But well, we can produce 55,000 a month on one size. We can, so, so based on order, you can put a tool in, do your run, and, and all of the value-add assembly is done and shipped all within two or three days. I mean, it's, it's a pretty efficient process, and it's, uh, you know, the cost on this is, is exceptionally uh, low. And our, we've done a lot of homework. I mean, there's, I mean, Vernon did a lot of homework on this, on this living hinge, and we perfected it with the material. You know, there's different thicknesses and different radiuses, so that it will conform to any side of the seat, and it and it uh, it, it will never crack. And and that's these are all key elements. Once you ship that, it doesn't come back. No, I I, I love that. I I know what a living hinge is. I I had a saucepan stir years ago. I never heard the term before, but. I, <laughs> Very familiar with it when the uh, when the paddle goes in the corners and so forth. But <laughs> we, we heard about Walmart a little bit. Uh, I don't know if you have any unique stories about Home Shopping Network, which is in your neighborhood, or other retailers that you deal with. Are there other people that have Made in America programs, or or how does that receive when when goods are made for retailers that you know where they're manufactured? Yeah, that's a great question. Well. Most big retailers have some type and they're following suit. Usually when Walmart does something or HSN or one of the big guys do something, other, others will fall into place. Uh, uh, Target has a, a Made in America thing. Uh, HSN had a Made in America thing. I don't know if they're still doing it since QVC bought them out, but they did. Uh, a lot of the uh, retailers do that. It is just very tough, as Chris had pointed out, to get the, the products that they want made inventoried at a good price so they have to run competitions and things like that to really look at the products and make sure that they can deliver the inventory a lot of us inventors when we have a prototype or just one version we think we're ready to sell to a retailer and in fact we're not and that's the biggest thing is we you have to be ready or have run manufacturing to really start approaching a lot of these retailers that are what want america you know made in america products Absolutely. So, so Chris, what about the, the uh, packaging and the design of the package? Do you do that yourself? Is that all American done? Do you have American designers? Yeah. Yeah. Let, let me tell you, let me just feed off of Carmine a little bit. Right. Think about this, right? If you're in China and you have to, you have to, you have to, to build out some product, right? You, you need a tool. I'm always getting quotes, 12 to 16 weeks tools or, you know, to get them over to the U S we're quoting in the plant. 
eight to 10, 10 weeks. And I know most of the time we get them done quicker. All right, then you gotta think about, like you said, how much inventory do you have to build to fill a crate? Then you gotta ship that to make it efficient to one of the coasts, right? Then you gotta, you gotta freight it in somewhere. You gotta freight it into a warehouse. That's cost. Then you gotta warehouse it somewhere. That's cost. Then you gotta fulfill it. That's cost, right? All of these things I think a lot of people leave out. Those are all additional costs that you have to absorb that to me, is, I consider that non-value. Trucking something from the West Coast to the Midwest or the East Coast is, is non-value. As opposed to now me, me building these, right? Building, doing the design work, building the tooling in the same building that you're gonna injection mold it. So any problems you have, it's instant, on site. I mean, you know, filling 22 inches of plastic is not an easy task. And we had some problems early on, we ended up going with a different ring gate to solve that problem. And by the way, this is patented in the US, China, and Europe. So it's, it's got patents all over the world, essentially. Then we're able to produce it in-house. I can build what I need. I don't, as one of the eight ways, I don't have to overproduce. I can build what I need, a little bit left over uh, as sample retentions and to do first piece articles and dimensions and, and some of the uh, destructive testing. And then we put it in a box and we put it on a pallet and ship it, gone. So you're invoicing it within days, not within months. Because right? it's retail already has a problem with cash flow. You're out 90 to 120 days before you get paid. So think about that and having 90 days from abroad that your cash is tied up. So you're talking about six months. So there's so many more benefits I see as doing it in the US. Wow. Packaging, yes. We went through three iterations on packaging. So we started with one early on with a, a package size about the size of the tidy hook because we, we weren't that convinced yet that we could bend it and it wouldn't take a set until we finished our testing. Well, now we've got all that done. So now we ship this inside a box, you know, that's bent. It's got two bags tied down with a, with a, with a band and it's, uh, and it's beautiful. It, it fits in a, in a PDA. We did all the graphics in-house. Love those big made in USA, <laughs> right? We did all these little symbols in the back. So again, not, not to make it too busy barcoding, but enough that if you're standing five, six, seven feet away, catches your eye, you want to come over to it and you can quickly see it's a device that sits on the side. And we tell you, right? Fast and easy clip-on installation. Only side of the seat bag, uh, designed with 60-gallon bag, built for the driver first. And then all of the other features. So when all this was done, we can do it in low volume. I don't have to build 100,000 of these. I can do 1,000 if I wanted to. Buy some tooling, that's it. You can do 5,000. Okay, the cost is a little bit different on the lower end than it would be if you built 100,000, but it's not enough to take a risk and to tie up all that cash. All the inventory. All so I, I, you know, customer, I think, I believe a customer makes up their mind when they walk past the product about, about 1.8 seconds. Right, yeah. Whether or not they have interest in it, you know. Right. So well, I think even for me, being at Walmart the first time, I was able to explain a tidy hook. It's not an easy sell, right? You have to convince somebody they have a problem in the car and that they want to be organized. But then you start selling some of the other features about going on a road trip for a soccer tournament, lacrosse tournament, football. You can now, you can take the bag off, right? It doesn't have to stay on. You can put your drinks you can take your lunch and you can take the bag with you. Use it and then bring it back. Or you can then take the home and use it on one of the tents with the same bag. So you've got two spots, now now you got a place for trash. So there's so many options. And for me to have the flexibility of, of having it really produced in the US at a great cost and being able to deliver on demand is amazing. You know, I, the, the, the Super Potty Trainer is another great product. You know, we, we, we're even now, doing it in different colors, but this is a, this one is a beauty. This one, we had two weeks to get this out. I, I, there was no label. We didn't have the silicone feet to, uh, designed or developed yet, which is the most critical point and, and, and component of this because it doesn't, it allows a child to sit and potty train without the seat moving. That's the biggest fear the child has is falling in. You know, then we had to get the resin. We did all of it including the display case box, which is normally a six week item. We did all of it and shipped it in two weeks. Wow, wow. 
so Chris, so tell me how, how do inventors, how do you work with inventors? How do they find you? And be, please, you know, let everybody know your email or whatever. Yeah, so just, uh, just to go tidy hook. So it's simple, tidyhook.com, superpottytrainer.com. Those two products, you can see a lot about those. Me, I'm under Guerrera.com, Christopher, Chris, Guerrera.com, or PaceImpact.com. Both websites have, like, the Pace is a little bit of uh, marketing and manufacturing. Chris Guerrera is really how I get involved with inventors. And I'll work with you from the start, from designing, right through delivery to retail, and or coach you in between. So I, it, it, it all depends on where you are with the product and how much work is still needed to get it launched. Absolutely. And I even do, you know, licensing stuff. I work with, you know, guys like, like Warren and, and Brian and, and, and Jim and, you know, guys that are in the field doing this all day long. We, we, we kind of work as a network and as a committee. Now, I, I'm sure you have to be uh, – when an inventor comes to you, what, what, do you, what do you expect besides honesty and, and hard work? Yeah, the honesty and hard work is uh, it's automatic. I mean, the trust thing, I, I use the line a lot. If you can't trust your mother, you can't trust me. It, it's really that simple. So that, that's an, uh, already for, you know, for taking. It's, it's automatic. So I like to see some design work done, right? It, it would be nice to have a proof of concept, some type of sample that you know you've done some work on. Because if you don't, then you're all over the map, and it's ju it just becomes – it becomes a money pit and I'm not looking to do that. I'm not looking to waste my time or their time on money pits. I like to take an idea that's got some, some merit to it. It's certainly plastic components are absolutely great. They, 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 they really mold themselves and meld themselves to good uh, assembly practices, but something that I could really take a look at. It, it's nice to have drawings mm -hmm. like step files, CAD files, the .stp file. So we can then take it and look at it and look at it in 3D and see if there's some changes we could make. And then we could, we could take it from that step all the way to the end, right? From, from that concept through tooling, molding, assembly, um, packaging, fulfillment, and shipping. Cool. Especially if somebody, folks, to repeat it, if you, if you really are one of Made in America and you want to pursue that route, uh, that's, that's a great uh, thing that you bring to the table, Chris. So, so Carmine, uh, maybe we can flip you around a little bit too. Um, and uh, I'm sure some questions have been coming in. Do you, uh, you want to pick up a couple of those off there? And Yeah, yeah. So, so um, one question that came in for Chris, and this, uh, he probably gets this a lot. If a product, um, say a product like um, just a plastic injector product or something like that, Came, comes to you, but you aren't able to really make it in the U.S., where would be your next, and this is, uh, just came in about two seconds before Warren did this, where would be your next choice of making a product? Yeah, I, 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 like you say, it can't be made in the U.S. I, I, I need to know what it is because I'm saying you can make it in the U.S. Well, not, not that it can't be, but there are some products, obviously, that yeah, aren't, I mean, I, aren't feasible you know, to me. Yeah, I don't normally get involved in going abroad. That's just, that's just not what I do. I, I'm a uh, I'm about keeping jobs here and keeping USA, uh, you know, the USA, USA. <laughs> I'm all about America, but, I, but I, I can put them in contact with other people that I know who actually uh, handle some of that. But I, I don't typically do that. I, I, don't, uh, I don't have a need to. I have enough, uh, hey Chris, enough Chris. products coming my way that, that can be made in the USA. I'm confident I can do it. If it's Chris, you, you have to learn how to say UIA, UIA. That's UIA, <laughs> UIA, USA, UIA. When we go back, when we get back uh, someday and we start uh, having dinner again, like in Vegas, that's we, sometimes we leave the restaurant with the UIA too. <laughs> so, uh, Carmen, there's probably other questions, or maybe if you'd like also, you could give people, you know, how to reach out to you as well, you know. Yeah, so one other question was kind of along the same lines that came in, um, how uh, I look for different countries to make products. And as I said uh, earlier, uh, I always look to the USA first. Uh, it seems like, and Warren and, and Chris, you guys probably get this a lot, that uh, all of us would love to see uh, products here made in the USA. Sometimes it's not feasible. Sometimes you have to go to uh, a Canada or Mexico, Guatemala. And it's just over time building up uh, trusted manufacturing teams out there. Um, and I, I please any of you inventors that are out there listening, don't go just go out to Alibaba or find somebody that you believe is a factory 
and start talking to them, thinking that they are factory. Most likely they're not. Talk to somebody who's trusted. Join the UIA. Uh, jump in. Talk to Chris. Talk to myself. Um, and we will love to point you in the right direction uh, for that all-important step of manufacturing your product. It could make or break you, as Chris has pointed out. Yeah, that's kind of interesting because, you know, I, I obviously deal a lot in the licensing side. And a lot of inventors pursue licensing because, obviously, it's lower risk. And, but then again, the rewards are, are, are lower commensurately. I mean, usually when, Chris, like when you, do you partner with folks? I mean, is there a split? I mean, I, you don't have to talk about the specifics or, or yeah. whatnot. But obviously, there's some risk involved. There's more risk involved, right? So some yeah. put up capital for this and so forth. It yeah, I mean, la launching a product is not for the weak. I mean, it's not an easy thing to do. It takes a lot of capital. And, you know, in, in the Tidy Hook and in uh, Super Potty Trainer, yeah, I did I did partner up and, and invest some, you know, a lot of my time in cash. But I don't, I don't normally do that. I, I certainly... I certainly will give the inventor or whoever it might be that needs guidance an understanding of what each step costs. And, and you know, without seeing it, I don't typically quote it, right? Some guys come to me and say, oh, I got this quote from a picture. I'm like, who quoted that? That Someone sent you a photo of a, of a product and someone quoted it? Yeah, I don't work like that. Like, I'm working in reality here because that quote's probably not going to be accurate. I, I'm certain it's not. So I, I'm happy to to quote out each step, you know, and because, you know, if you don't have packaging, you don't know what it's going to end up like, but I can use scenarios that I've already had and roughly what it costs to do it and what a stamping die would cost and what the ultimate end package would cost as like in tooling. I mean, I'm pretty familiar with injection molding, the size of a part, the, the, the uh, you know, the, the typical drop size. I can quote a tool pretty quick, but it, it's good to have, if you have a design, you have drawings, it's, I, I can quote you roughly what it's going to cost. So you understand the amount of capital required to truly launch a product. But to some of your clients and people you work with, do they come with, you know, resources and funding? Do you, do you work with angel investors or do they work with angel investors? There's a variety of things. All the a, I, I'm all over the place on that. It's a variety. Some have no cash and a lot of dreams. Some have lots of cash and, and want to move forward. But I always tell them up front, product launch is not for everybody. As Carmine said earlier, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of adjustments and tweaking that goes on and there's a lot of cash associated with launching product. And, and, and then you have to get into retail, right? If you're looking to, to do that, then you have to have a you know, marketing group and, and uh, websites. I mean, I, I get involved in, in all that so I can provide full service. But it, 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 it definitely is, is, there's a cost structure associated with it. Well, tell me about, tell me a little bit for, fun, we're going to have fun now. Tell me a little bit about the personality of the inventor and, and what you expect from them and uh, how you work with them. Um, you know, like I get, I get a lot of calls on the licensing front and it's not long before I have a certain, you know, I, ex, I, I ex, expect people to be honest. I expect them to be polite. I expect them, you know, to, to uh, give me this scoop in a short amount of time, I expect a whole bunch of things. What are you, what are you looking for uh, when an inventor comes to you so that people listening today can, uh, can get a feel for how to work with someone like you? Yeah, I like to hope, you know, I like to think that the person is completely invested in it. Not just, um, not just with these, these wild thoughts because it, until you get it on paper or until you get some type of structure to it, it's just an idea, I mean, which is good but it doesn't go too far, right? Because a lot of people have ideas that, that never take off. But, the, but the, the inventor has to have some passion behind it and really some reality behind it. You know, I, you know, I've had somebody ask me if he can get something into retail in six weeks and, and it was on a yellow sticky sketch. I, I thought they were kidding, they were dead serious. So, so to me, it was like, they truly didn't have any idea, like they weren't educated at all in the field, and that's fine but it's not reality. I want somebody that's gonna work with me and understand nothing's quick in this business, right? It's, it, it all takes time. I certainly feel like Made in America, the way I do it, I can get it to market faster than, than anybody else. I feel like I'm incredibly competitive on cost, but there has to be a reality check on where you are with your current design and how does it fit into a manufacturing cycle and, you know, and, and really the, the length of time and capital it takes to, to launch it. 
No, that's good. That's good stuff. And 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 uh, let me just. Uh, we may have other questions, but it, it, every time you speak, it makes me think of something else. So you and I have been very involved in Make Forty Eight, which is mm -hmm. a terrific television show on PBS and a series about developing products in a short period of time and so forth. Tell us a little bit about Make Forty Eight, your experience there, and how you've helped people that, on that show. Yeah, I've been. Uh, that's been really a, a fun show for me. I mean, I I, I think I've only not been part of. The four or five that they've had it's been a lot of fun and i've always every time i go i meet new people i mean it's been it's been great and 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 the teams that that are so energetic i mean think about think about 48 hours right you show up someone tells you there's a category and now you have to come up with a solution for that category in 48 hours now i've sitting on the focus group a couple times and to me it's it's about halfway through it's like the 24 hour mark where you get to you get to tell them, they, they, they pitch you, you know, you get four or five minutes, they pitch it and you get to tell them what you think, they're, if they're going the right direction or not. And I always like to start with, it's a great idea, right? It looks good most of the time. Have you, have you thought about cost? Because you can have the greatest product in the world and if you don't have the right cost structure, nobody's gonna buy it. So, so I try to always, you know, coach them in that direction. Think about the entire cycle, not just solving the problem but if somebody's going to buy it it's either going to be through an online network or through a retail channel and retail is competitive and need to make sure the cost structures are right so so what i find is they really listen and it's it's it's, it's so exciting to see the changes that they make and when they present the final product and some of your thoughts and your ideas that, that you had showed them went into it right. and it's the simplest idea sometimes that just you know it, it wins the it wins the battle because it solves a, a problem that has been around so long, it becomes cost effective and it's and it's easy to market. Yeah, we we're, we're testing uh, one of the uh, the items on uh, TV right now. So oh, great! Uh, so <laughs> it also it's amazing, Chris, when all of a sudden you take that product and the prototype and you shoot a commercial for it and you blend in all the other, and all of a sudden it just com it comes to life and you wow. go, yeah. crap, this thing was an idea. So, yeah. so we know more when you when you say that. I, I think about I always tell an inventor. It is the coolest feeling in the world when you start with something that's on paper and then you walk into retail and you see it on the shelf. There's a feeling oh, yeah. I can't describe to you because it's not, it's not a, an easy task. It takes a long time, a lot of getting after a buyer, but to finally walk into like a Walmart and see it, yeah. it's, it's unbelievable. It's pretty uh, cool. Absolutely so. Yeah. So Carmine, do you want to add in here? You, any questions you want to throw in here or, or, or a little of your own experience as we're getting towards the end here? No, no, no. All good stuff. Everything that Chris said, I agree with. It's so important. Uh, all of the things that we're talking about for inventors to listen in, um, you know, go out and get as much help as possible. And I agree with, uh, with Chris. It is the coolest part. I even love seeing I did some backpacks for a client and uh, actually saw somebody wearing one of these backpacks in the airport. And of course I walked up to him and started talking to him about it. They thought I was like accosting them, but it's so <laughs> exciting to see a product that you've created, you made and it sold. And then you see somebody actually using it. It is a lot of fun to see that. And, and I wish that for, for every inventor to really experience that one time. I had that experience in Ireland once when uh, we launched Mr., which we used to make up in Connecticut, Chris, up in Bethel, Connecticut. And, uh, I was in Ireland. Uh, we stopped late one night after golf to eat dinner, and uh, the proprietor asked me what I did. Well, I said, I'm working on this project. It's called Mr. He goes, well, what would that be? And I go, you know, anyway, blah, blah, blah. You know where this story is going, right? So he, he uh, you know, asked me, and I'm answering the questions and all of it. He goes away, and about three minutes later, he goes, it wouldn't be looking something like this. He says, I was in New York last week. I saw it in one of the stores and bought it and brought it home. <laughs> but anyway, well, this, is, uh, this has gone really quickly. Uh, Chris, Carmine, give your names and how to reach you one more time for everybody. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so for me, it's, it's, it's my name, chrisguerrera.com. And, awesome. uh, you know, he's involved with all these things, Tidy Hook, uh, Potty Trainer, Pace, all these other things. Or reach out to the UIA and we'll, we'll, we'll connect you with Chris. Uh, yeah. Carmine? Yeah, no doubt about it. UIAUSA.org. Um, check them out. Uh, definitely join if you are not a member. Uh, you can contact me, all social medias. You can see me online all over the place, CarmineDenisco.com or EarmarkSourcing.com. Any questions you have, reach on out. And uh, if I can't answer your question, what's great about the UIA is that we will find somebody who can. Um, that's about uh, the main thing that we could talk about here.
Yeah, and, and, and Carmine, I don't know if you want to spend another minute, but let's talk about that, the Made in America podcast you and I started. That's yeah. another great tool for people to learn how to make their, their products in the, in the, the USA. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah listen ahead. in, subscribe to the Made in America podcast. Uh, we'll definitely be talking about something really cool each week. And if you have some stuff, let us know. We'll try to uh, focus on it. Yeah. And again, if you forget all this stuff, just reach out to us at the UIA and uh, we'll, we will connect you properly. So, yeah. hey, Carmine, thanks always, always for hosting. Chris, thank you so much for coming on, buddy. Appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Very cool. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening in. Mr. Warren Tuttle, I appreciate everything you do. Uh, Mr. Christopher Guerrero, thanks for jumping on today. And we will talk to you next time. Same bat channel. You all take care.